Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Genghis Weekly Investor Briefing. My name is Damaris, the Head of Marketing, Brand and Communications at Genghis Capital. Today is April 26th, the last Monday of the month, and I'm very excited for this edition. One, because we are hot off the heels of our Friday masterclass on bond valuation. So I'm looking forward to the discussion we're going to have with Churchill when it comes to fixed income. Churchill is the head of research. He'll be taking us through microeconomic outlook for Kenya for the week. He'll also be guiding us on the fixed income conversation and sharing with us the trading recommendations for the different bonds that are in the market. We'll also be tack tackling the equity segment of our market. Hopefully our equities dealer, Kevin Ginge, will be able to join us. If not, Churchill will also guide us through that. Lastly, we will have an overview of the global financial markets. Thank you to... Thanks to Matthew Kabire of EGM Securities, FX PESA. Genghis Capital has a partnership with EGM Securities, which allows our share trading clients access to the global financial markets. So if you are a Genghis client or you want to be a Genghis client and open up a CDS account, you also have a unique opportunity to tr trade on those different commodities. Our session is interactive. So please use the Q&A tab to send in any questions you may have and we'll tackle them towards the end of the session. You can also use the chat function to share any comments and thoughts that you have as we start. I also want to welcome two new members of the research team just before we start. That is Wesley and Melody. They're joining our research team and we're really excited to have them in future editions to actually grow the conversation. So Churchill, I think we can start. Um, over to you. Let me allow you to share your screen. Uh, thank you, Damaris. Uh, good welcome to everyone who has joined us today. You're good to go. Uh, thanks. Okay, yeah, good morning again. So I'll walk you through the macroeconomics and also the fixed income for the week. So to kickstart uh, on macroeconomic, uh, the calendar for this week is quite heavy as compared to the last two weeks or so. Uh, what we have in terms of the budget cycle, this is for the next financial year, which is starting from 1st of July up until 30th of June next year. Uh, we have uh, what was on the cards to be submitted by tomorrow. That's the draft budget estimates on one hand, and also the finance bill, which is supposed to be submitted tomorrow. So in regards to the draft budget estimates, what, and, uh, what we are looking at is uh, uh, the, uh, the submission of the estimates to the executive primarily, primarily. By the executive, I mean the ministries, departments, and agencies. Looking at the ceiling that was given in the budget policy statement, which is the anchor document for the budget, uh, we're looking at uh, 1.91 trillion to be that that was uh, to be extended to the executive. On the other hand, we have uh, 17 billion that is supposed to go to the judiciary, and then another 38 billion that is going to the legislative. This is the two houses in parliament. So for the national government, what I mean the national government, I mean what is going to the executive, what is going to the judiciary, and what is going to the legislative, the three arms of the government, we're looking at 1.97 trillion in the next financial year. Uh, so the draft budget estimates, draft budget estimates that we'll be seeing, uh, if it's stable tomorrow or sometime in this week, will be more or less along those uh, ceiling of 1.97 trillion that was uh, put in the budget policy statement. The finance bill, also another, another key legislative piece that we are looking at uh, for primarily to look at the new tax revenue streams for the next financial year. Uh, for the current financial year, we're looking at uh, ordinary revenue at 1.5 nine trillion this is expected to jump by 181 billion to 1.78 trillion in the next financial year so that difference 181 billion part of it is due to the organic growth last year was a bad year so revenues were slashed down but because the expectation quote unquote that this year will be a good year so in light terms uh, ordinary revenue 
has increased uh, by that much to 181 billion. So there's that portion of organic growth, uh, which will also propel robust revenue collection, which has been priced in that 181 billion. And also there are new tax streams or new tax proposals that will be the, at the crux of the finance bill 2021. So that's what we'll be keeping an eye on uh, either tomorrow or sometime this year. Parliament right now is on, is on recess. It is expected to come back on Tuesday next week, but nonetheless, uh, there are some rumors or there are some indicators that there could be a special sitting on Thursday uh, for the proposed BBI bill, uh, the Constitution of Kenya Amendment bill which is its formal name uh, on Thursday session. So probably we could see that if that comes to fruition, we could even see that these documents are tabled on Thursday session. Uh, also another, uh, in the, another report that is expected to be out this, this week following the recent trends is now the 2021 economic survey. It's a bit of a rear view mirror looking at what 2020 uh, Panned out a bit in terms of these major indicators, but nonetheless, they are good, at least in terms of the expectations for this year. So the first uh, key thing that we'll be looking and keeping an eye on the 2021 economic survey is now the growth, uh, growth estimate for 2020. We know, we all know, or it's a conventional wisdom that last year was a bad year, was an ugly year as compared to the recent years. Uh, just because of COVID-19 pandemic. But what was the actual 2020 growth number that will be in the report? Was it 0.6% that Treasury is talking about or 0 0.6, negative 0.1% that the IMF is looking at uh, as the growth for last year or anything in between? So that will be what will be part and parcel of the 2021 economic survey. The supply side basically means the sectors, manufacturing, agriculture, and all those other sectors that you may think about, that is on the supply side. And what is on the demand side, uh, so there are two sides of the coin when you look at the growth, the supply side, the sectors, and also the demand side. So the demand side speaks to, say, the government spending because it has a part, it's part and parcel to the growth uh, in any given calendar year. Private consumption, what you and me uh, consume, uh, it also tallies up to the growth. Uh, There's what is called gross capital fixed formation or business investments, how businesses are in making the investments decisions. And finally, the net exports. Uh, so all those uh, four factors are what are considered the demand side of the growth. We're also looking at the employment uh, statistics and, and also the balance of payments as at the end of last year. So far, the balance of payment is basically the current account deficit and uh, majorly current account deficit. And what is contained in the current account deficit is the merchandise uh, trade and also the service trade statistics. When you're talking about uh, merchandise trade is Basically, the exports and uh, importation of goods, the services, mainly we're looking at uh, tourism sector that was majorly hit, so we didn't have those tourism receipts. And also parts and parcel of the current account, we have uh, the diaspora remittance, which has been those, which is part of the unilateral receipts that we receive as a country. For last year, we saw that it jumped uh, significantly, I think 10% to 3 0.1 billion dollars, but nonetheless, uh, we 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 are seeing uh, which was better than what was initially expected with COVID-19. So services we expected to go down. Uh, uh, the merchandise trade deficit is expected to go down by the fact that not that we had improved exports, but because imports were lower than expected, and on the other hand, tourist uh, diaspora remittance was quite healthy. So the current account deficit is balanced by the capital accounts uh, on the other side, what inflows that comes in on any given point in time, be it the external debt that we are looking at, uh, the, the external debt that we receive goes into the cap is considered under the financial accounts. The, uh, um, the FDI's foreign development investment is considered under the capital uh, financial account. And also the inflows that we talk about on any given day, at some point in this presentation, we'll talk about the inflows by foreigners 
last week. So on accumulating basis in any given year, so that statistics also ends up in the financial accounts and that is what we call the balance of payments. You can use it to be able to see the direction of the shilling against the major currencies or any given currency, but it's, it is quite uh, pivotal when it comes to currency, this uh, balance of payments. So all this will be contained in the 2021 economic survey. I've just tried to summarize a report that goes close to a thousand pages into like two minutes of this time and later this week we expect the april 2021 inflation rate uh last month was at 5.9 percent uh mainly we're looking at the fall inflation that's what has overshot uh last print was at 15.8 percent looking at where it is uh on the back of uh the retention of the epra fuel pump price reviews so moving on to the fixed income uh, segment, uh, this is now Damaris' favorite after that class that we had on Friday. Uh, secondary market T-bonds activity declined 35% to 17.3 billion. And the activity was majorly on the IFB's uh, infrastructure bonds and specifically the 18 year infrastructure bond that was issued uh, top of this month. Uh, T-bills, performance rate of close to 60% at 14.4 billion. And yields you've seen on a year to date basis, they have climbed by 0.61%. And if you compare with the lows that we saw July last year, we are seeing that on average, uh, yields have gone up 1.56% uh, from the lows that were there last year in July. So there's been a steady uptick in treasury bills yields over the last uh, couple of months. Getting down to the liquidity trends uh, for the week, last week rather, in terms of the interbank uh, rate, it climbed by 0.73%, we can make to an average of 5.6%. On the other hand, uh, which also solidifies that the, that tightness in liquidity uh, is that the CBK intervention were majorly on liquidity injection. So what it does on a, any given day, CBK assesses the liquidity in the banking sector. And if there's a need to address those liquidity shortages, uh, it, it puts out uh, what is called a reverse repo instrument. If, there's in, uh, if the liquidity is on the supply side, so they do a reverse repo, the repo to mop up the excess liquidity. So for last week, uh, they were majorly on the reverse uh, repo side. So amounts that were sort of 30 billion, bids received 58.25 billion, they accepted 40 billion at a weighted average of 7.99%. Our calculation in, in the net domestic borrowing, as at the end of last week, we were at 392.3 billion. That is inclusive of the CBK overdraft facility. And the domestic borrowing so far, as a percentage of the overall target is around 72.6%, which we are thinking is slightly ahead of the curve. 72.6% at this point in time is not that bad. So uh, from the fiscal perspective, I think there's some latitude and that also speaks to the next slide, uh, the issue for next month's primary bond issue. So there's a reopening of uh, FXD2 2019-15. Damaris, are you still on the call? Yes, I'm still on the call. Quick one. Uh, you attended the class on Friday. So, so don't even you... Churchill, don't even. <laughs> let, let, me, let, me, let me just ask you a simple question. What is FXD2 2019-15? If you may break it down to a layman. Ah, okay. So that, I was so thankful. I thought you were going to ask me to interpret other things. <laughs> that is a simple question. So this is this. Uh, it's a fixed coupon um, treasury bill. It's a second issue issued in the year 2019, and the validity period is 15 years. All right. So you are attentive at the class that we had on Friday. So ideally, yeah. this is the second 15-year paper that was issued in 2019. So it is being reopened. And also there's a new 25-year uh, paper being the first 25-year paper being issued this year. And that's the FXD1 2021-25. The target amount is 30 billion for budgetary support. And looking at even the quantums that we've been seeing over the, this financial year, outside the 
I think there was a 25 billion that was issued in December, but on average, you've been seeing 40 billion, 50 billion, 60 billion that are being issued. So 30 billion issuance at this point in time is telling us that uh, the government is not under much pressure to come and uh, borrow from the market. And it speaks to the 30 billion that is being sought. And the withholding tax is at 10% because by the fact that they are uh, these issues, the initial tenors of this paper were above 10 years. So that's the withholding tax on the coupon rate uh, that is. So we're looking at uh, uh, just uh, the FXD1 2019-15, the effective tenor is 13 years. So I think this is the first time that we are seeing, but the, the value date of these May issues is on the May 10th, that will be two weeks from now. And at that date, we'll be seeing a semi-coupon payment on the FXD1 2019-15. So basically, the existing bondholders in this particular paper, they'll be receiving their semi-annual coupon rate. That's 12.734% divided by two, which is around 6.37% they about on that date. And that is the date that we'll see uh, the val that is the date that we that this May primary bond is being valued at. That is the initial time frame. So it's bang. Existing bondholders receiving their semi-coupon payments, and then the people who will be getting in will now be setting afresh. Uh, the implied yield on this paper is 12.8%. Back again to the class that we had. If the yield is higher than the coupon rate, it means that the clean price is at a premium, is at a discount. And that is where the clean price is at 99.49. But because of the accrued interest, uh, since the last coupon payment up until, uh, up until last week, it was around 5.77% for every 100. Remember that this semi-coupon payment is around 6.37%. And if you look at from the last semi-coupon payment up until last week, it had already accrued 5.77 of that. So that you add it up to the claim price and then you get the data price of 105.26. Uh, again, the coupon for the 25 year paper is market determined, which will be known at the auction date. So our week trade, uh, we just pivot away from the primary bond auction will give the recommendation at some point this week or by next week. But nonetheless, we're still looking at opportunities uh, on the infrastructure bond that was issued early this year, early this month, uh, where we've seen that yields have declined on average. Uh, if I say 34.5 basis points is basically 0.345% on average, uh, the bond was the yield at the auction was 12.667%. At, at the end of last week, it was at 12.313%. Uh, so it has declined slightly. And that means that the price of the bond is being priced at a premium, basically. So we see that there's still some headroom for further yield declines, which if you flip it around, that the bond will still appreciate slightly. Uh, because it has an attractive uh, coupon rate at 12.67% in the IFB portfolio. So those are some of the things that we're seeing that will still lead to a rally in this current price, at least for the better part of this week. Let me stop there. I'm not too sure whether Kevin is on the call. Uh, Churchill, Kevin is not on the call yet, so I would encourage you to do the equity section. All right. Thank you. So in terms of the equities recap for last week, uh, both indices increased as, uh, as a marginal 0.3% to 165.61 to the NASI Nairobi All Share Index and to 1,888.25 on the Nairobi Share Exchange 20 Share Index, NSC 20. Tanova also increased 2.8% to, uh, to 2.4 billion over the course of last week. 
top dinners, uchumi, scan group, scan group, and bamburi. Bamburi, uh, no brainer here, uh, announcing a dividend uh, on the back of the full year numbers. So we're seeing uh, people now coalescing into that uh, counter. Top losers, uh, TP, TP Serena, uh, BAT, and Capturua. Capturua, we've been seeing that it, it keeps on flipping. Uh, one week, it's one week it's on the top gainer, the other week it's on the top losers. So that has been the trend, I think, in the last uh, five weeks or so uh, on this counter. Now, moving on to the uh, foreign activity, uh, something that I had uh, alluded to earlier on in the balance of payments. So for last week, we saw that foreigners uh, were on the net outflows uh, segment. They exited. Uh, as they, their exits were more than their inflows to the tune of 86.7 million. And in terms of the participation, as compared to the overall uh, participants, we are seeing that they are still dominant at 57.6% uh, participation in last week's activity. Uh, there were foreigners were accumulating on Safaricom, KCB Group, and they exited, or they were net sellers on Equity Group and EABL. Top traded uh, counters by foreigners, uh, no changes here, Safaricom, Equity, EABL, uh, clocking the top three traded counters by foreigners. Uh, moving on to NSC, where the NSC sits vis-a-vis -vis, uh, select African peers. Uh, we are seeing in terms of this metric, uh, price to earnings, uh, whereby you're looking at the price of uh, Nairobi share or where the index for Nairobi all share index is as compared to the earnings uh, for the underlying companies. We're looking at it sitting at a multiple of 12.5. Vis-a-vis uh, an average of the select African peers at 10.6 multiple. So we're seeing that it's slightly expensive as compared to uh, these African peers. Dividend deal is lower than uh, the average select African peers at 2.5% at against an average of 4.8%. Uh, in terms of corporate calendar, this week, today, uh, final day for KCB Group. Tomorrow, uh, for today, uh, KCB Group, one shilling, uh, final dividend uh, book closure date. Uh, tomorrow, stand charts, uh, final dividend of 10 shillings and 50 cents. And then on Thursday, the 30 cents uh, final dividend for Kenjin, uh, clocking up the book closures for this, uh, for this week. I will still have uh, book closure dates, but for next month, starting with Stanbeck at, uh, 20, on the 21st of May, BOC Kenya on the 26th of May, Jubilee also 26th of May, Kakozi on the 31st of May, NFC 4th of June, and Total and Umeme both on the 25th of June. Uh, finally, our trading ideas for the week, we're still pitching. Uh, those stocks that could weather the COVID-19 storm, uh, those ones are the ones which uh, rank higher in our recommendations and are also part and parcel of the portfolio of the momentum portfolios uh, that we keep an eye on. Uh, that's Safaricom, Equity, KCB, and also EABL. So those are the ones that we see because of the moment in. In, in our momentum portfolio, those are the ones that we continually pitch. I, specifically for this week, we reiterate our trade uh, for last week. This is stand chart. We're still seeing that uh, it doesn't move that much in terms of the pricing. Uh, on the date when it announced its full year 20 results, which was which was 141 shillings. And also at the end of last week, it, it closed at 141 shillings. So it's telling us that investors haven't really priced in uh, this dividend uh, <coughs> dividend announcement of 10 shillings 50 cents in the pricing. So it still has an, an attractive dividend, dividend yield of 7.4% against the banking sector average of 3.5%. And that uh, marks the end of our present of my presentation. Which I'll stop here and uh, invite you to walk us through the global markets. Thank you, Churchill. Welcome, Matthew. We hope you're well today. Good morning, everyone. I hope I'm sound and clear. 
Uh, apologies last week, I had challenges with my connection and um, I've really worked on it. My team has worked on it and we're good to go. So let's delve into the global markets. Um, last week, just a second. Yeah, last week we were, I for the, for the few minutes I was able to speak, uh, maybe you, you were able to catch something about the ECB. We were waiting, waiting for the news from the European Central Bank and the news from the Bank of Canada. So last week, the ECB uh, met the expectations and uh, it was expected that they will uphold the interest rates, leave them unchanged. And um, the asset purchases were also steady and that um, made the Euro USD hold steady above 1.20. The crude oil prices on the energy sector remained under pressure because of the demand and supply issues. Um, of course, crude oil inventories in the US, they came up uh, a little bit, uh, were increasing. And then they were, why, sorry? Let me jump in. I don't know if you're sharing our screen, your screen with us, but all we're seeing is you, which is good. But if there's a PowerPoint, we're not seeing that. Yeah. Yep. It's thank you. Thank you for that, Damaris. Yeah. Um, just looking at like last week's uh, recap, huh? and I was talking about uh, the Bank of Canada threatened to hike, uh, tighten its monetary policy. It scaled back to its quantitative easing program, and that one is um, a signal that the Canadian economy is likely to to recover as we move forward to the 2021. So they eased down their support to the economy in terms of the quantitative easing. And that one, if we can, if we will be able to look at the chart, you see that the Canadian dollar appreciated quite a lot uh, on, that, on that event release. Um, next, look at what is just in the offing this week. The Federal Reserve is set to decide its interest rate again because you have the, the, um, the FOMC coming up and then something about the oil, the OPEC, they are meeting this Thursday. That will give direction to once the, uh, the what where the oil might be moving to. So traders are looking forward to see the, 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 the results of the Federal Open Market Committee meeting and um, want to see whether the Feds will tighten its current monetary policy. Tightening means uh, getting in to try and curb the inflation. Right, and coming the inflation, meaning that reducing the quantitative easing or their purchases, or even trying to increase the interest rates to cap on the inflation. But over time, we've seen a laxity, uh, not actually laxity, it's um, the, 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 the central bankers uh, are more confident with the way the inflation is flowing, because that's what they view is going to raise the economy and the US economy and get it back to its feet. Up until the inflation levels have reached where the feds consider um, uh, the best level to intervene, to try to taper their purchases and even um, increase the interest rates, then we are likely to see um, a loose, uh, um, the loose monetary standing as we, as we are at the moment. So that meeting is very important. Um, to give us that direction. The market labor, the, the labor markets, uh, it's still weak. The payrolls are 5.5 below the pre-COVID uh, levels because they have to go to the pre-COVID levels for that to hint a likely recovery. Um, in the energy markets, oil tanker, oil traders, um, again, keep their eyes on the OPEC meeting on Wednesday. Uh, we had the US, uh, US has, has come up with, they want to start suing the, the OPEC plus countries because um, they are thinking they are increasing or they are influencing the oil prices, right? And um, the production costs, they, they want to come up with uh, uh, antitrust and production uh, uh, cuts um, claims against those countries that are increasing. Uh, the oil prices. Now, the calendars, that's how they look like, the economic calendar. You can check it out. We have got so many websites that offer them. But of course, if you want to check out the FX Pesa, again, you can find it. And I can find out their reports on the 
OPEC on Wednesday. It will be coming up on 28th, that's Wednesday. And um, of course, US um, personal income spending, that is going to be very important as well. But even very important is the FOMC statements for the directions of the US. Remember, we are picking the key, key events that will be coming up. So on uh, the products to watch, we look into the oil, looking up on the oil. And um, last week, the prices, of course, suffered from the surging COVID cases in Asia. Remember with the oil, it's all dependent on the supply and demand. That is the production levels and the demand for the economies. So for example, on this uh, Wednesday meeting, which is coming up for the oil producing countries, to speak about um, whether their actions on either increasing the production or cutting the production or how they are going to balance that one with the current demand where we're having, for example, the cases rising in Asia, it means that uh, there are more restrictions and uh, there's less production because people are getting restricted. And so there's no high consumption of fuel. If there's no high consumption, then of course the prices will go down because there's low demand. Those are the two uh, uh, parameters that, or two factors that keep on weighing on oil. And, um, Asia, India, Japan, we've got COVID-19 weighing up on them. And of course, that one seems to give us a hint that economic recovery in those, in those regions is a little bit uh, going to take a little bit longer. And that one um, gives a weak demand for the, U, for the oil. And um, last week, again, the US crude oil inventories went higher. So if, this, if the inventories are higher, it means the production, the, the consumption is low. That one uh, puts pressure on the oil. Let's look at the technicals. On this chart here, as at the time when I was capturing this, uh, this, this, uh, this screen or that chart, still the oil is on an uptrend, pushing a little bit higher because of the steady and slow recovery. The, 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 the consumption is getting a little bit higher, but you can see as from a um, uh, better, better part of this month, it has been declining, of course, because of the, 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 the COVID-19 still it's here with us. But looking at the technicals, um, it's on an uptrend. The, the, the price, the oil price is at 62, they're above the 50 moving average, as you can see. The moving average smooths out the, the noise of the market, so that at least you can see the direction because you look at the candlestick, it's just up and down. So the price is above the moving averages and um, it's on an uptrend. You look at the momentum there, it's above 100. So still a bullish uh, movement, right? An upward outlook. And um, the technical levels we're watching out here for an upside, for a strong upside move, these prices must move, move above uh, 62.6 for traders to really have a higher level of confidence that this price uh, of for the oil for long positions to target the levels of 63 or maybe even higher than that. So the key level to watch for a good upside move is 62, right? That's when it will have gone above the, the, the short-term resistance there at 62. On the downside, of course, we have a 61 level. If um, the, the, the supplies, of course, keep on rising and the COVID-19 is not really controlled as much and, um, get disagreements on the control of supply and production, then we might see the oil prices going all the way. Uh, if it's able to break below that trend line and maybe move below the 61 level, might go to test that strong support at 59. But currently, uh, there's, there's a higher bias on um, a bullish move because, of course, it's above the moving average. We just have to wait as traders and see whether to break that 62 level. And um, the next instrument we want to look at is uh, the gold. And we're looking at gold because of the upcoming uh, decision about interest rates or the monetary policy on the USD. Remember, uh, for the people who are trading gold, you need to watch out on the strength of the USD. That's why it's very important to watch out on the fundamentals on interest rates. Yeah, interest rates, of course, that's ones that are given by the uh, the, these FOMC meetings or the US uh, Federal Reserve meetings because they release information about uh, the interest rates. Interest rate has got a direct, will give a bearing on the strength of the USD, right? The inflation, because of course people go to buy US dollars uh, based on their 
expectation of the inflation, right? Because the gold is priced in terms of the US dollars. So if the US dollar weakens, then it means that people are looking forward to the gold becomes cheaper and that that's the time to go and buy, right? And again, when there is inflation, it means that um, it's a hedge. So when you have gold, then it's a hedge for the inflation. And of course, people also, the trader watch out for the bond yields, right? Because again, bond yields and the interest rates, they have some correlation. Currently, the bond yields are a little bit low, right? And the US dollar index, again, is low. And what is going to move that is the federal open market. So looking up on the technical there, um, and of course, on the last week, last week, there was um, a, 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 an uptrend. So the gold was not able to really pass above the 1800 psychological level. Um, so investors are looking forward to see what happens with the inflation, whether the Fed will keep the interest rates uh, near zero. It's around 0 0.25. If you keep it there, again, it seems that they're not as much concerned to try and control the inflation. That means that gold might get some support there. And um, that is going to keep the gold from suffering bigger losses. But we look, look at technicals there. Uh, gold seems to be on an, um, an upward channel. So currently around the lower, uh, that, that uptrend, that trend line there still trading above the moving averages, above the 50 moving average. Look at the momentum, it's um, showing some bearish move. So keep technical levels to watch. Of course, we want to look at whether the price will maintain above that 50 moving average. That one will, will show some strong support around, around that level, of course, around 1760. If it gets hold of that support at that level, then we have the momentum moving again above 100. It's a signal of an uptrend, but again, for a strong uptrend, traders have to uh, watch for the price to break that um, 1800 level for a strong and a higher confidence on having or riding an uptrend all the way to the 1820s, maybe, maybe, maybe all the way to 1870s and, and above. But currently, ticket levels to watch, make sure it's, it stays, it holds above those moving averages. And if it's able to buoy or swing above that uh, 30 EMA or above the moving averages, remember we want to look at when the moving averages are found out. So if the, if the price, whenever the price just gets into the moving averages, trying to break them, and then it's not able, gets back again, buoys back and above the moving averages, we might look for, look for positions in that favor. So currently, the, the, the prices are just in between the moving averages. We want to make sure that price goes above that moving average, maintains there, and if it depicts and breaks that 1800 level, then that could be a good position to target all the way to 1820s and above. Again, wait for the outlook on um, the, the outlook of the Federal Open Market Committee on Wednesday. So on the stock side, remember earnings earnings are very important when earnings come up, if they are positive, because when you're looking at the news, you want to see whether the earnings come up better than expected. If the, if the results are better than expected, then it means uh, good performance for that company, right? But again, even better if you want to follow up on, um, if you want to follow up on the performance of these, these stocks, make sure you look at the price earnings share and all those, I think, um, Chachila has, has got more information on how you can analyze the, the stocks more on the fundamentals, but basically they match the, the same, same things. Price earnings, price, price, price earnings, uh, price per, is it price to the earnings or PE, right? Churchill has more on that, maybe you can speak more on that. But on the earnings, on the market checkout for Tesla and all those there, I'll be highlighting a few was my favorites, but for you, you can choose. This this report will be given up to you there, so you can check the ones as you like. But these ones are giving their earnings this week on Monday, Tesla. Remember, Tesla is something that has been um, trending the market so much, right? Um, Microsoft on Tuesday and Pfizer. Check out for Facebook for on this list of uh, social media. Spotify on Wednesday, Thursday. Check out for Neo, right? Twitter, Amazon. Friday, we have Chevron, Exxon, AstraZeneca. Check out for all those. And if the news come up positive or better than expected, 
um, again, check out all the technicals, you might get some opportunities to get in there. For the dividends, um, Tuesday we have the real and all these are lined up there. Please make sure you check out this list and pick out the ones that you really trade on and you can find pretty good uh, insights to get positions. Right. And even important is uh, on the FX Pesa platform, again, you can trade on um, the local single stocks, yeah, and as well, even the index NSE25. So, and that one is specifically is for hedging, right? Um, if you've been holding positions, for example, and uh, you see there is, a, 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 it's not trending upwards as you have been expecting, you might take a short position just to hedge on that um, uh, fall in prices. So thank you so much. That's what I had from my end. Over to you, uh, Damaris. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to start the Q&A session and I'll start with you, Matthew. There are two questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, Anne Saragi was asking, what are your moving average parameters? Uh, what average moving? <laughs> moving average Aver parameters. Moving average, yeah. moving averages. Well, the moving averages I'm using, I'm using the, the 50 moving average, 50 exponential moving average and the, and the 20 uh, uh, exponential moving averages. So right. what, I, what I'm looking for is a crossover because um, there, there are different sets of moving averages you can use. It, it depends on um, what really works for you. You can combine um, a fast moving average with a slower moving average. And what you want to see is a crossover, maybe, or the price keeping above that moving average. That one gives you that it's likely that the average closing prices for the period which you've selected is, is upward. That's what gives you um, a hint to either enter to buy or sell. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to advise uh, Nelko, because Nelko was asking, what is the short term outlook for Bitcoin? And I know in different um, sessions, we've talked about the fact that we don't actively track that. But maybe you just have a brief commentary. He wants to know the short term outlook, buy or sell. So I really cannot give that unless if I check on the charts and um, see where it is. If you can give me a few seconds, uh, give me a few seconds. Uh, Bitcoin okay. chart. Uh, perhaps as you look up that particular chat, I could answer a question I saw on the yeah. Q&A tab. Uh, Charles Oma was asking, hi all, how do you track your dividend payment on the Jacuzzi app or do you have to track them personally from the companies? So Charles, I think the first thing to mention is the fact that dividend payment is between the shareholder and the company you've bought the particular stock from. So for example, if it's a Safaricom dividend, the dividend payment is going to move straight from Safaricom to you. It's not gonna involve your broker, in this case, Genghis Capital. The only part we play a role is when you opened your account, you indicated your preferred means of dividends disposal, whether it was by bank transfer, or by check. So you have to do it personally, uh, but we can always help you figure out whether you selected bank payment or check. Although I think checks are really trying to be phased out, more so because they're mailed to your postal address and lots of people don't have postal addresses nowadays. So I hope that assists you. Matthew, have you been able to pull up your chart on Bitcoin? Yes. and. Um... When I look at the Bitcoins, I see that um, it's on an uptrend. Remember, for me on my side, I rely so much on the technical. So currently I see it's been holding on um, some form of consolidation, right? Between the 5200, $52,000 52, $52, and currently at the 53,000, it's like it's breaking above that level. So looking at the technicals, uh, um, it's, it's on an uptrend, right? Mm -hmm. But really, I can't speak much about Bitcoins. Like, um, like Daman, I say, we don't track much of it, but you can look forward for some, some, some bullish move, but make sure it's supported by technicals. Currently, it's above, um, it's, it's just been bouncing off a support level and um, you can find some, maybe some, some long position there, but make sure this is just advice and my opinion. Uh, um, make sure you can, again, get it supported by your technicals. If it, I, I think, in my opinion, if it's able to 
to break above that um, 50, it's around 53, current around 53, is able to break that consolidation level there. Uh, it, it's really a, a, a big margin between 57, 57, uh, 686, all the way to 50, 53, uh, 00. If it's able to clear that level, then it might be on an uptrend to test the 64s or maybe 62, 63, 64s. But um, again, that's my opinion. Make sure it's in line with your technicals as well and the fundamentals. All right, thank you so much, Matthew. I'm sure that made sense to everyone who was interested in cryptocurrencies. And Nelko, Nelko says, thank you. Um, I'd like to move to another question. This is from Wallace Mburu. He asks when we expect to get the NMG 2020 year financial reports. And he also notes that INM announced to give bonus shares. How does this impact on the share price and why? So Churchill, could you fill that particular question? Uh, thanks, Damaris. Uh, thanks, Wallace, for posing those questions. On NMG, uh, looking at the trends that you've seen, uh, around what time do they release their full year earnings? Looking at uh, when they released full year 2019, when they released full year 2018 results. Uh, so based on those trends, uh, we are expecting that full year 2020 will be released by sometime this month. So we're looking at any time by the end of this week, if the trends that you've seen in the last uh, releases of uh, the full years is anything to go by. So be expecting it either sometime this week, or if not, if there's a delay, I'm assuming that they've already uh, notified the authorities, the regulators, the NSA about it. So, but on the baseline, you're expecting it to be released sometime this week. Uh, that's for the NMG. Of course, I think this is also in line with the cautionary announcement that they did, that share buyback announcement, which was uh, put out, but we didn't see much details around it. So that also will be something that will be keen to find out whether it will be preempted, even in the full year 2020 results that will be announced when they are announced, that is. In terms of IM, uh, yes, they announced a uh, share, share bonus of one to one. So for every one share you have in IM, there's a bonus share that you'll receive one to one. And the book, the closure of that uh, for you to benefit for that is on the 10th of May. So that's two weeks away. So the impact of that, the current shares outstanding in IM is around 1.86 million shares. So what that means is that now we are seeing the shares going up, uh, multiplying by two, 1.86 million to doubling that is around 3.6, 3.72 million shares, they are about 3.72 million shares. So what that means is we expect that even the price, the closing price of AM shares was 45 shillings per share as at the end of last week. So expect it to halve so that the market cap for the company will still remain the same in after accommodating this uh, share bonus price. So that's the expectation that uh, once it's been priced, once the uh, share bonus has been affected, so for every one share you get to receive two shares. So that means that even my pricing, so my share will have to go into, will have to halve so that it's more or less, um, I'm still the same. The net effect of share bonus is I'm having a neutral wealth effect. I, it's not that I'll, uh, I'll have an extra uh, money in my account, no. So what that means that my price, uh, the share of IM has to halve so as to accommodate a commensurable increase in the shares. So the net effect is the same. So the price will have to halve for it to, to as, as, an, as an effect of the share bonus. All right, Churchill, thank you so much for that particular clarification. Bernard Onsongo asked, which is better, which is a better bond to invest? Is it the FXD2 2019 or the FXD1 2021? Churchill? Oh, uh, a trick question again. Uh, I think it was also asked even in the class that we had, but ideally it depends with uh, what 
as an investor looking at. Uh, so if your investment horizon is uh, 25 years, perhaps I'm just assuming uh, uh, that say you are uh, 20 years or 20 years and then you have a number of years to go before you, you retire and you still expect that you'll be receiving income during that period. So at 25 years will be a good bond for you or looking at your liquidity needs. So you are investing, but perhaps you're looking at uh, the income streams that will come from this investment will go to fund a particular need that you may have, perhaps financing your education in five years, a wedding or whatever it is that you're looking at as an investor. So the choice of uh, a specific board ultimately boils down to an investor an investor's demand at a, an, at, at, at any given point so looking at uh, your investment horizon your liquidity needs or the tax preference but at least for the two papers uh, the withholding tax is uh, 10% on a like on like basis but nonetheless uh, for the uh, 15 year paper you're seeing a um, coupon bond coupon payment of 12.73% each and every given in any given year and um, for the 25 year which will be market determined i think could be i don't know depending on where the market is what the market is looking at could be probably higher than what is being offered at uh, by the 15 year so if you want higher income perhaps the 25 year will speak to you so even in as much as the investment horizon will be shorter than 25 years you're looking at five years and then at the end of five years, you can uh, sell the bond at the secondary market, but you still get access to better uh, income every six months. I think the second five years will be more ideal for you. But nonetheless, it's what, uh, what speaks to you uh, as an investor that will dictate which bond will end in the upcoming primary bond uh, sale issue. All right, Chacha, understood. So it depends on my particular, my particular needs and goals as an investor. I want to address uh, Raphael and Clinton's question. They're asking about the money market fund. So Raphael asked, uh, on the money market fund, how can I track the interest rate on the Jacuzzi app? So I've opened my own Jacuzzi app application. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how vloggers do this, but- yeah, Share your screen. <laughs> share my screen <laughs> cute so once you log on to the jacuzzi app you click on invest once you click on invest now you have a whole array of different products you have the stocks if you're interested in buying different shares then you have unit trust if you click on the unit trust right on the landing page uh rafael it shows you the prevailing rate the current rate and then it gives you the option of buy right at the top next to it. So right now the rate is 9.87%. Then you can just click on buy and purchase that particular, um, um, purchase as many units as you want. So <laughs> there, you can see there is clearly buy and sell and the interest rate is indicated. If you click on buy, then you can input the amount you want to purchase, which will be 500 shillings and above. So that's how you see the interest rate and purchase. When you go to portfolio, I won't show you my portfolio because it shows you how much I have currently saved. But your portfolio amount, it changes every single day. So if I had, for example, 10,000 today and I earn two bob today, tomorrow it'll show me 10,002 shillings. So you're able to see the incremental growth of your savings. So that's the effect of the interest. Clinton, I think you'd asked uh, for us to talk about how the unit trust on the jacuzzi app works so i think that explains it just navigate yourself to invest choose unit trust then choose helaimara and then you're able to purchase sell and see your portfolio i hope that has been useful and you're very much welcome rafael damaris we wanted to see a portfolio at least uh -huh. to see that i can see portfolio in the jacuzzi app hey, uh, no 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 there are some things which are for the investor so me as an investor, I choose privacy. <laughs> Damaris, uh, demonstrate, demonstrate for us, Damaris. Just show us the portfolio. We won't you judge. Will, you will be staggered. You will be flawed. I really want to save you from that. 
Now, uh, Churchill, Faith is asking for the minimum amount that is required to invest in the 15-year bonds and the 25-year bonds. I have an answer, but let me let you tackle that. Then we deal with the last three questions in the Q&A tab. Minimum amount to invest is 50,000 for the two bonds. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we covered that in our master class. So I shared the link to that particular session, the Friday session in the chat. So if you wanna revisit, you can do so. If you want a copy of the presentation, just drop the marketing team an email, the email address I, I provided. Um, um, yes. Sorry, sorry for cutting you short. Uh, there's, there's that uh, attendee who asked about um, the Bitcoin. If you allow me to share, a little bit of technicals I've been able to pick up. Oh, yes. please, please go ahead. All right. Um, hmm. So if you check out here, I, I hope you can see the screen. Oh, not yet, no. not yet, not yet. It's yeah, coming up. my screen? Yes. All right. So um, checking out on the technicals a little bit about the Bitcoin. And um, on the daily, you see, you look at the RSI that it's coming off an oversold level. And on the technicals there, the price has, is, is below the moving averages. But um, when I check out that trend line, the price has got a very strong support there, which has been a previous resistance level. And um, it's like we have a pin bar coming up. Looking up at the candlestick structure there, we have a very nice engulfing candlestick here on the daily, right? But up until this price uh, breaks above this moving average, that's when you can have the confidence of really going long, maybe to target the 64 levels. This one seems more of um, like a short squeeze, something like that. But uh, up until we see this price going up aggressively, when we get back to the four hours on the same um, on the same instrument, we see there has been a consolidation. This is what I was talking about. I realized I was just um, I, I could not. I was just speaking that you cannot see the, the actual structure, but here. Again, a pin bar, a very nice engulfing candlestick. Currently testing the slow moving average, the 50 moving average. And look at the RSI, it's about 50. So signaling uh, price getting from, from bearish uh, market to bullish market. So if it breaks above that um, that moving average, might look for a, a, a short term entry, maybe all the way to, to see whether it's going to break that 57 level. If it breaks that one again, by that time, we'll have a crossover probably, and then could be a signal for the upside all the way up and up. But that's my opinion again. Make sure you again analyze the market. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, so now, Ko, and anyone else interested in cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, that was Matthew's perspective. Uh, a couple of more questions, and I want to combine two here. There's one from Willie who's asked, clarify what is what it means by implied yield clean price and dirty price on the secondary market. And Grace was asking a similar question where she's kindly asking us to explain how we arrive at the dirty price for a bond. So Churchill, could you answer those two? Um, Okay, so I believe you can see my screen. So this are the this is the slide that we had put out there. So basically, the implied deal that you are seeing this is as of the end of last week for this paper that is trading. Uh, the FXD2, it's supposed to be FXD2, 2019-15. It's a paper that is already trading, so it has a price that is there currently. So as of the end of last week, this the, the yield on this paper was 12.8087%. So what that means, as co and if you compare with the coupon rate, because the yield is higher than the coupon rate, the price for the bond is below par. So for say every 100, you find that the pricing, uh, because the yield is higher than the coupon rate, the pricing is below par. So that's where the clean price is coming. So the clean price is now the price of the bond. Uh, it's basically the future values, future, uh, the summation of the present value of the cash flows for a bond uh, for PAP to bring on board 
uh, some of the one-on-one -on, -one on bond valuation. It's basically looking at uh, because the bonds, the a bond pays coupons every six months, what we call the semi-coupon payments, and then at the very end of that life of the bond, it pays you back a uh, hundred. So just using a hundred. So let's say you invest a hundred thousand, you'll get back a hundred thousand at the end of the fifteen years. So the present value of these cash flows one hand the same coupon payments up until the very end and also your investment back in, in your in initial investment at the present so that is using the implied yield so that is what is giving us the clean price of 99.49 but the aspect of the dirty price the difference between the clean price and the dirty price is the simple fact that uh, because this paper is already trading those a coupon payment that was made uh, six months ago uh, around uh, November period. So up from the last payment that was made November up until today, that portion of an interest or the same coupon payment that an investor is entitled to is called the accrued interest. So if you add that add up that accrued interest to the clean price, you'll get back your dirty price. So the data price of 105.26 is arrived by adding the accrued interest component to the clean price component. So that's the difference. But we've just put the figures for the FXD2 1915, which is already trading currently. For the 25 year paper, it's not trading. So that is the main, that is the implied yield, the clean price and the data price for this particular paper. I think that is the first question. Uh, what was the second question, Damaris? Uh, let me kindly retrieve it, just one moment. It was from Grace. Grace wanted to know how you arrive at the data price for the bonds, and I think you've touched on that. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. All right, then. Thanks so much, Churchill. Okay. Uh, Juanet was asking, is it possible for corporates to open an account on Jacuzzi app? Bernard, I'm going to assume you mean um, Okay, I'll tackle both. If you're a corporate and you want to open a share trading account, you're not able to do so on Jacuzzi app. Jacuzzi app is for individual investors. So if you want to open a corporate account either for share trading or for the money market fund, please reach out to us either via the chat. The app itself has a chat function. So you're able to say, I'm interested in opening up a corporate account. And then the team will be able to guide you. I see you say it's for the money market fund. So yes. Um, corporate, it's possible to open a money market fund for them. You just can't do it on the app. The application is meant for the individual. But if you use the chat function, our team will be able to share with you the account opening requirements and you are able to do it uh, via email. So looking forward to having you join our team. Lastly, Churchill, a recap on how the coupon, coupon rate is determined during auctions of treasury bills. That's a question from Willie. Damaris, yes. let me put on the spot. Now let me put on the spot. I'm using you as the boogeyman for the participants who attended the class on Friday. Make an I'm attempt to do that. I'm not prepared on a Monday morning for this ambushes, Churchill. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so back to the question. Uh, treasury bills are essentially zero coupon bonds by the fact that they don't pay coupons uh, as the way you will see the bonds that we've tackled so far, uh, the bonds that we've discussed so far. For treasury bills, they are, you could think of them as uh, zero coupon bonds and uh, they are deemed as discounted securities. So what happens is uh, say, and the investment that you look at the face value for treasury bill is 100,000 at the very minimum, at a minimum 100,000. So it works with 100,000. So for 100,000, what happens is it works backwards. Uh, last week, I think the 364-day T-bill was around 9.5%. Uh, 9 so that means is at the end uh, for the 364-day T-bill. So at the end of one year, you'll receive your 100,000, but you work backwards. What investment will I place or which investment will I make so that at a rate of 9.5%, I get back 100,000? So it's discounted securities. Uh, principle kicks in. So we are looking at around uh, a pricing of uh, say 91,000 
or 92,000 thereabouts that you invest in, and then at a yield of at an at an a return of 9.5 percent, you get back 100,000 at the very end. So that's how treasury bills works, and it's different. It's a reverse of the way you could uh, value a treasury bond. So zero coupon bond, treasury bill, and then the the valuing of it is now the reverse. It's a discounted security. I hope I have answered it. I think you've answered it, but I think, okay, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but maybe Willie was asking, you know, every Thursday when the CBK, I don't know why there's an echo, but every Thursday when CBK publishes the results of the auction, how do they arrive at those particular results of auction? Maybe that's what he meant, because you are talking from the investor perspective. Or how they arrive at the yields? Yeah. How do they, oh, okay. How do they? Because I think the question was, what? How do they arrive at the coupon rates for the treasury bill? So I was trying to demystify that there's no coupon bond anyway. So how do they arrive? Uh, say, for instance, uh, treasury uh, CBK has floated uh, this week's treasury bill. They're seeking 24 billion. So 10 billion for trisk for the tenor. And then assuming that you, they receive three bids, uh, one from Churchill, I give a one billion bid at say 8%, and then Damaris at uh, 7 billion at uh, 9%, and then Matthew at uh, 1 billion at 10%. So what they do, CBK will now average our bids, the three bids, and then come up with a, a market uh, market the the market weighted average bid but then it has its own accepted average bid so for instance if the average comes to around 10 percent but then they wanted it to be around nine percent so they'll reject the the bid that was placed in at 10 percent so matthew's bid is now rejected and then they look at the average of my bid and Damaris bid, and then they average it out, and then they come up with a, uh, with that's how they come up with the pricing of uh, the the average accepted bid, and that's the average. So for an investor who did not put in an actual yield for the risk for the T bill, uh, what is called non-competitive bid, and those non-competitive bids are for those investors whose maximum amount is. 10, 20 million and below, you can put in the non-competitive bids. So the average yield between Churchill's bid and uh, Damaris bid is what will be able to invest as an investor. So that's the mechanics uh, around uh, pricing for treasury bills. So they just look at the, the averages, uh, the bids that have come in, they reject those uh, aggressive bids, uh, and then they do the math again to arrive at the average accepted bids. Okay, that's understood. Thanks so much. The final oh, question. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ask, ask the question and then I'll come up with, with something. You know, okay. Yeah. All right. Titus's question, I'm going to try and understand. He wants to know if we have a bond op option for investors who want to invest in money market through our Hele Mara. So I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but Helaimara is a way for an investor who's interested in participating in the fixed income market, but maybe doesn't have the required minimums. Remember Churchill mentioned that the minimum, for example, for a fixed coupon bond is 50,000. So let's say right now you don't have 50,000. The next best thing you can do is invest in a money market fund because a money market fund invests in fixed income instruments. And the good thing is that it has a low minimum. So for example, the Helaimara money market fund, the minimum is 500 bob so whether it's for 500 or for 5000 or for 10000 you can deposit money in this fund jengis pulls all this money from different investors let's say about a million different investors and then let's say our aum is like 10 billion then we take this 10 billion and invest in different bonds and t bills and things like that then the return we get we equally disperse it to the different investors so in that way any person, whether you have the 50,000, the 100,000, or the 20 million minimums Churchill is talking about, through a money market fund, you're able to participate in that particular market. 
So I hope I've answered your question. And I think with that, we can hand over to Matthew who has something for us before we conclude. Yeah, Damaris, last time you dared me to ask Churchill questions. And I have something little for you, but it's quite simple, Churchill. Um, for me, when I'm trading on the other side, I will look up on the maybe moving averages, the check on the economic calendar, check on some other indicators. Now, when it comes to our local stocks, um, what tickers, in addition to the technicals, of course, that you're looking at, what tickers should you have on your on your tracker? Like, for example, you have your Safaricom stock and you monitoring it, you have a position there. What tickers should you have there in terms of like maybe three, four that are very basic or very important, like price earning or those type of things? What would you recommend for the end? I was about to borrow from uh, Damaris uh, Liv what she said earlier that on a Monday morning she doesn't have a thinking cap on. But anyway, let me just give it an attempt. Uh, so when it comes to equities, how do we look at it? Uh, uh, I know that from uh, the global markets perspective, uh, there's that high weighting towards technicals. But when it comes to the, the equity side, what we ideally look at it is on a fundamental basis. That's what analysts do. Uh, look at uh, anything that now fundamentally affects uh, the companies. I know that uh, now that you've mentioned Safaricom, I know that uh, there's been a bit of some uh, news flow around Safaricom over the weekend. And even today, there's that aspect of uh, the, the Ethiopian telco bid. Uh, Safaricom has put out a public notice that it's uh, it's part of a consortium that is uh, that has uh, placed its bid for the Ethiopia telco telco license, and then the results will be out in a thirty uh, after thirty days. So that's one of the things that we keep an eye on fundamentally because it will now change the revenue dynamics for Safaricom even going forward. So we are really heavy on the fundamentals. Of course, even the on, um, on even if you look at it from a top-down approach, uh, that from what's happening on the macroeconomic uh, perspective, uh, what's the growth uh, for the country, what's the consumption trends, and that's also, as we start our presentation, we usually look at the discussions about the outlook for the macro. So those ones also have, have an impact even in the fundamentals of a company top-down approach. So fundamentally, we are looking at the fundamental factors that we keep an eye on uh, that affects primarily the revenues and also the costs for the company. In a way, also, the other issues that also affect the pricing or what we see outside even what we assess as analysts is now the, uh, the sentimental sentiment around the, the company. Uh, it could be some... Uh, some string of uh, negative news sentiment or some string of uh, positive sentiment. So, but those ones are now outside the scope of analysts because you might have a target price at uh, 32 shillings, but now there's that 32 shillings, but right now it's trading at uh, 35 shillings or 37 shillings per share. So already there's a positive sentiment, but now the fundamentals are slightly, if you factor in the fundamentals, it's giving a different figure, a different valuation, but still the market is has a, 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 a positive sentiment around that stock. So those ones also, we keep an eye on them, uh, but ultimately what determines the intrinsic value is now the fundamentals of a company. I hope I've tried to answer your question to the best of my ability this Monday morning. Yeah. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. Thank you. Actually, that's what I was looking out for. Okay. Next time I'll be the one now shooting a question to you. So I'll... <laughs> it's, it's an interactive session, no problem. Uh, All right. And I think that's, open mind, yeah. Yeah. yeah, when you spoke about the earnings, I think one of the things we'll be keeping an eye on this week, uh, AstraZeneca, the Pfizer's, I know that last I think two weeks ago, Johnson & Johnson, despite the fact that even in the US where it, it's primarily, it's, its main market is, it released some uh, earnings that even beat expectations, uh, even despite the fact that uh, the vaccine for Johnson & Johnson was uh, canceled in the US. But nonetheless, there are a number of products under the Johnson & Johnson portfolios that, uh, I mean, made it have that robust earnings 
than what even the market was expecting. Uh, but it's something that will also make us keep an eye on the AstraZeneca's releases, the Pfizer's releases this week uh, in terms of the earnings. Uh, FMC, let me not even shoot a question to you because it will be like a revenge. So I'll call my horses for today. I'll get you one of these days. I mean, but as you say, it's interactive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of it all, it's just, you know, our discussion is giving more information to our listeners and they get some insights. Again, these are opinions that we discuss. They get insights on just to sharpen their outlook in the market and get the best trade. Remember, all this, we never sat in. We, there's no only ever 100% about the market, just about relying on probabilities, whether on stocks, whether on, on this other side of the global markets. Thank you, Chachi. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen. We always like this robust discussions. So before we wind up, I just wanted to clarify something. I forget exactly who was asking about dividend payment, but I think I misspoke when I said you follow up directly with the company. You don't go to Safaricom directly. You go through the registrar of companies. So for example, image registrars, you follow up with them in case the dividend date, the dividend date has passed and you've not received your payment. So I believe that brings us to the end of our session. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you so much, Churchill. This discussion has been useful as always. Uh, a recording of this webinar will be uploaded to our Jenkins YouTube channel. Please feel free to subscribe in advance. You'll get an alert. And this time next week, we'll be open up, opening up a new month. That's May. So I'm sure Matthew will have new developments for us, as will the macroeconomic fixed income and equity space in Kenya. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you next Monday. Have a fantastic investing week ahead.